네, 그러면 오늘 그 어스시 세미나 어, 12월 프로그램의 첫 번째 행사로 그 제킴 큐레이터가 발표하는 협력적 구조들 지역 사회와 샌프란시스코 베이에리어의 회복력 이라는 제목으로 토크를 시작을 하려 합니다. 오늘 우선 저희는 지금 저는 대한공원 루프에서 디렉터로 활동을 하고 있는 양지윤이라고 하고요. 그리고 저희가 지금 샌프란시스코 아트 커미션하고 대한공원 루프가 같이 협력 변실을 기획을 했어요. 그래서 어, 루프에서는 9월에 자매들 우리는 커진다 라는 제목으로 전시를 했었고 지난주에 이제 샌프란시스코 아트 커미션에서 그 전시를 세계의 씨뿌리기라는 전시를 오픈을 했습니다. 그래서 저희 같이 공동 큐레이터인 제키 임 선생님 모시고 이 지역에서의 활동들에 대해서 그리고 생태 예술 관련한 활동들에 관해서 이야기를 나누려고 합니다. 네, 하이 제키. Good to see you. Hi, nice to see you. 네. <웃음> 그러면 우선 지금 또 제키가 선생님 계시고 김지원 선생님이 오늘 통역으로 통 번역으로 네 참여해 주실 거예요. 그래서 우선은 그 제키 선생님 발제와 어, 문을 먼저 받아서 저희가 번역을 했던 어, 텍스트가 있어서 그것들을 띄어놓으면서 같이 이야기를 했으면 합니다. So um, in order to save time, um, actually. Um... Uh, we have a prepared already a uh, translated text uh, maybe we can uh, there is a link in the chat box also it's a it's a, in the google drive um, or i can share the screen 제가 화면을 공유를 할까요 and 네, or, 그러셔도 yeah. 될것 같아요 okay. yeah that would be better all right uh, so uh miss miss im or should i call mm -hmm. jackie um yeah you can start um um by your own and then you can start uh, whenever you're comfortable and then you'll follow along the text together. Okay. Well, yeah. 한, 한 가지, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but no, just, just for um, notice. 하나는 또 이거 오늘 발제하고 끝나면 Q&A 시간을 좀 가지려고 합니다. 그래서 채팅창에 혹시 질문이나 생각들 있으시면 남겨주셔도 되고요. 아니면 끝나고 다시 그 어, 저희 이제 인터뷰 Q&A로 참여를 해주셔도 좋을 것 같습니다. Mm -hmm. So we we'll have a brief Q&A session after the talk. So anyone is like in, uh, uh, welcome to leave any comments or questions in the chat box. Thank you, Jackie. Okay. So Thank shall we start? Yeah, right. I think I share the screen. Okay. Great. Um, so I'm going to start with like a little bit of background. Um, in 2018, I was invited to write about artists living and working in the Bay Area for a now defunct online art magazine, Art Practical. Uh, to provide a little context, I was born and spent the majority of my life living first in San Francisco and now in Oakland. With the advent of the tech wave of the 2010s, the San Francisco Bay Area began to see artists struggling to make a living in the region as rents continued to rise. Uh, similar to artists in many other cities, the cost of living made it difficult to live as an artist without the constraints of full-time jobs or the patched together network of freelance gigs that often added up to more than a full-time jobs workload. Artists are hurt twice by an increase in rent. First, of course, it becomes harder and harder to afford the places they live. But additionally, the kinds of buildings where studio spaces can be found began to feel the pressure of increasing rent with some converted to open offices or mostly by now shut down web companies. When I wrote this essay in 2018, Many galleries and project spaces were closing, in addition to the many artists leaving, and it seemed like an open question as to how the art community could survive. This is just a screenshot from the, from the website. Mm -hmm. 
It is hard to talk about the Bay Area art scene without the specter of tech and gentrification. Indeed, it is hard to talk about the Bay Area as a whole without talking about tech and gentrification. Uh, we continue to talk about wages frozen, rent hikes, we have going away drinks, we pursue opportunities in other places like Los Angeles, Santa Fe, Portland, Berlin, New York, and on and on. The essay I wrote titled Support Structures highlighted the many different reasons artists and art workers choose to stay and how they make it work to stay. I had stated in that essay that there isn't any one solution that will keep artists and art workers here. Rather, solutions are found among a whole network of models that need to adapt and change. And how a few years and a pandemic later, those same conversations continue. We are constantly thinking about how to find solutions, sharing job openings, available rent controlled apartments, grants, or other initiatives designed to support artists. And so a brief history. Uh, the San Francisco Bay Area art world has always emphasized artist communities over an art market. Operating outside of New York and other traditional hubs for sales and commercial galleries, the arts became about friendship groups and common sensibilities, eventually taking on a name, sometimes dubbed and sometimes adapted as a credo. The beats, the funk artists, the mission school artists, among others. This photo is of um, some of the beat and beat affiliated artists in front of City Lights bookstore in North Beach. Mm. The North Beach area is a beat and artist group and people are related to For many of these groups, circumstances as simple as cheap housing, a shared background in graffiti, or a place to gather became the seed of their formation. The unique flavor of different neighborhoods from North Beach to the Mission to West Oakland also helped to shape these communities. The artists in these groups often struggle to get by, creating work that sometimes function outside of the mainstream, yet they found ways to thrive artistically, buoyed by peers and sometimes the occasional benefactor. In the 2000 essay I wrote, oh, sorry, in the 2018 essay I wrote, community is the key to staying motivated and continuing this work. In other words, form a squad. Curator and artist Margaret Tedesco organized an exhibition of work by the experimental filmmaker and artist Kurt McDowell in San Francisco. The show featured handmade movie posters and props, but it also featured many drawings of McDowell's circle of friends in the film and art communities of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. McDowell's drawings pointed to a strong kinship of folks who supported one another, posed for each other, appeared in each other's films, and were fans of each other. They were the people who were crucial to sustaining McDowell's life and work, and I see echoes of this with many of the artists and art workers I know. This is just one of the examples of the many, many drawings that have um, his peer group. Connection and community are one of the reasons artists choose to say, and how do and so how do we establish ways to keep these communities thriving? How do we create a scene that supports long-term residents as well as the newcomers? Studios and residency programs are one such avenue. Established institutions such as the Headland Center for the Arts, Kala Art Institute, and Recology all provide residencies to artists at many different stages of their careers, and in the case of Headlands, also gives space for artists who are not local, encouraging a dialogue with those outside of the region. But outside of these institutions, there are also studio spaces like Real Time and Space, Dog Patch Studios, Hunter's Point Shipyard, and many others that provide much needed studio space and community for artists who live and work here. In the early 2000s, veteran curator and poet Renny Pritikin wrote prescriptions for a healthy art scene and has become a frequent touchstone and topic of conversation both in the Bay Area and elsewhere. 
it's not the greatest resolution, but this is the um, a screenshot of the prescription for a healthy art scene. So I can read a couple of them. Um, one, a large pool of artists. There's that. Um, there's a critical mass or tipping point that makes a scene. Uh, active art, art schools, which feed into the pool of artists and give artists teaching opportunities. A social space where new ideas are being generated about art, about society, about the role of art. And then let's go to like number 10, newspaper critics who are thoughtful and sophisticated and talented. Just a few. 가장 좋은 해상도는 아니지만 이제 그 처방전, 건강한 예술 현장을 위한 처방전이 많은 그 이미지화 된 거를 스크린샷 하신 것이라고 하고 여기서 이제 이제 목록들을 보실 수 있는데 일 번에 보면은 어뭐 굉장히 많은 어떤 예술가의 그룹들 거기에는 어 이제 비판적인 그 대중과 아니면은 어 어떠한 그 현장을 만드는 데 있어서 어 중요한 포인트들이 있다 어 그런 식으로 어 그리고 두 번째는 어 teaching opportunities 그 가르치는 기회들 어그 예술가들의 그 풀헬 서포트 지원하기 위한 어떤 어 이제 뭐 교육 기획들 뭐 이런 여러 가지 그런 처방전 같은 걸 보실 수 있고요 마지막으로 어일십열 번째 십 번을 보시면은 newspaper critics who are thoughtful and sophisticated t a l e n t e d 어그 신문 어 비평가들 어그 굉장히 그 사려가 깊고 어 세련되고 굉장히 어 유능한 한 뉴스페이퍼 그 비평가들이 필요하다 뭐 이런 식의 어떤 처방전들이 나열된 걸볼수 있습니다. Um, Pritikin's list encompasses both the social and institutional supports that make up a healthy art scene, informal social spaces, critiques and other gatherings, as well as art schools, fellowships and grants and newspaper critics. A common thread in the list is the encouragement of dialogue, which pushes against the trope of the solitary artist. Pritikin's list understands that an art practice needs voices, people to lend new perspectives and a critical eye. The how and why we make it work comes in many forms that a talk like this will invariably fall, fail to encompass. Some of us get by through local familial connections, a network of financial and emotional support. There are also peer networks supplanting family relationships for stability and support. There is also hard work, multiple hustles juggled to keep one's head above water. And there is also simply luck. A good stable job, an apartment with cheap enough rent, a lucky break in your career. It is also crucial for an art scene to have a variety of spaces that support local artists while also showing work by artists outside of the region. Exhibition spaces from every level, from museums to mid sized nonprofits to commercial galleries to artist written projects. Each play an important part in providing opportunities, encouraging a flow of conversations and ideas, and in simply being spaces where artists can gather and see art. What makes the scene feel lively and thriving? They become a draw for artists to continue to come here and choose to live here. The best of these exhibition spaces understand that they are part of a larger ecosystem. They become hubs for a cross section of artists, viewers, and collectors, as well as through ways for artists to move through their careers and to grow their practice. As the tech wave and resulting gentrification of the 2010s began their effects on the art community, it was the combination of artists leaving and exhibition spaces closing that caused alarm in the scene. Many had commented that San Francisco often saw waves of artists arriving and leaving before, but it was the shuttering of commercial galleries, project spaces, and nonprofits that gave pause. What becomes of a scene if there are no places to gather? So today. The effects of the pandemic on the San Francisco arts community and indeed across all sectors are still to be de determined. Sheltering in place upended many people's lives, but in particular, art workers and especially performers were impacted. The shifts that the art world faced and continues to face during the COVID-19 pandemic are perhaps emblematic of larger shifts across other sectors, 
lower paid staff were furloughed or faced risk of exposure in public facing positions, artists, musicians, actors, and many others lost sources of income. In San Francisco, artist murals on boarded up windows were subsidized through a nonprofit. The city government initiated a guaranteed income pilot program for artists and other granting institutions pivoted from project specific grants to general operating in the hopes that small arts nonprofits could survive. These were part of a larger movement that relied on the pivoting of local and federal governments, foundations and granting institutions to support organizations both in the arts and outside of it. This movement, movement also encompassed mutual aid groups and less formal structures of support, such as free town fridges, um, refrigerators placed in public areas, providing free food or other goods for people to take. These are often run by informal groups or individuals and rely on the public to donate items or GoFundMe fundraisers. These community slash peer uh, oriented supports often emerged to provide care for those most in need. They provided free food, clothing, personal protective equipment, and other supplies. They also sought monetary support for workers who were furloughed and cannot find alternative means for income. And this is an example of one of the free town fridges in Oakland. This is in Oakland. Free town, free town, free town, free town. For the art community, the COVID-19 pandemic was the impetus of many shifts. For some, it meant moving. For others, it meant stepping away from the art world entirely. And still for those of us who stay, it became a further patchwork of solutions or schemes that combined to allow people to stay. This is not unique to the art community, but these schemes applied to many whose livelihoods were thrust into precarity teachers, hospitality workers, food industry workers, and more. So what then for a community that is now recovering? Gallery openings vary from pre-pandemic crowds to nearly empty as the community responds to viral levels or simply have gotten used to spending more time at home. And what does recovery mean? Winter brings increased positivity rates as well as other seasonal viruses. Yet we are encouraged to unmask and gather. What is the balance between a pre-pandemic lifestyle while also taking precautions? How can we also provide support to those at risk, the immunocompromised and our elders? As we all return to work, what happens to mutual aid efforts? What happens to the time we devoted to these efforts and how can we continue to carve out that time? Thoughts on care. One of my ongoing areas of interest and in research has been around the radical potential of care and kinship. I think a lot about communities of care and how they can be sites of how we can move uh, in in spite of capitalism and other sorts of harm, sources of harm. Even prior to the pandemic, I was interested in how we provide support to each other recognizing the shortcomings of capitalism to truly care for people, communities, and other species. It has become abundantly clear that communities of care will have to make up the shortfall. I return frequently to Donna J. Haraway's writings on communities of compost and making kin. For Haraway, compost becomes a place of possibility where waste is transformed through care and attention into something rich and nutritious. She connects this with the urgency of our planet to live differently, with more wholeness and with consideration of ourselves and other beings and the earth. Anthropologist Anna Lowenhop Singh refers to the arts of living on a damaged planet to reimagine and rehaul the systems we live in today, capitalism, consumerism, waste, accumulation of wealth with an eye towards a more holistic way of moving through the world with collaboration compassion and collaboration. Haraway describes the work as intentional kin making across deep damage and significant difference. The adjustments to everyday life 
dealing with the pandemic over the past few years have shown the power of this kind of thinking, as have movements for social justice. The multiple documented incidents of Black people being murdered by police came to a head in 2020 with the murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis, Minnesota police. Across the United States, protests and demonstrations in support of Black lives took place and along with the many deaths that occurred before and since then, prompted a nationwide reckoning with race, forcing the country to recognize something that was not new, but was something that could not be glossed over easily. The uprisings in 2020 pushed many to do what Haraway described as intentional kin making across deep damage. It pushed institutions to consider the ways they have harmed Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. Institutionally, some of the responses were symbolic at best, a diversity statement or a land acknowledgement, while also still upholding the barriers that exclude BIPOC communities. But for many individuals, the uprisings prompted more thoughtful approaches towards kin making and care for communities that face oppression. These efforts don't excuse the state from inaction, nor do they replace legislation and other official efforts to address injustice and need. For example, the now common use of tools like GoFundMe to crowdsource money for medical treatment or assistance with living expenses for people who get sick or whose family members get sick or those seeking gender affirming surgery. While well, the sheer number of supporters is incredible to witness, it is powerful to see communities band together to support one another. But as heartening as these small su successes are, it does not change the fact that the medical establishment and our nation as a whole owes people more. Protest, small scale efforts to alleviate suffering. These are all like compost, messy ways to produce change but also like compost, if the energy and effort is kept up, the production of fruitful soil, real progress, and a more just world. So this is artists creating work on centering care for a place. Um, switching gears. I've talked a bit about the ways in which artists locally can support each other and the strategies artists and art workers have come up with um, to be here. And so I wanted to touch on artists who have adapted these considerations to address not only their art communities, but also a broader local community. Each of these artists create work that takes a great deal of consideration on place and the particulars of locality. Two of the artists I'll mention are included in Sewing Worlds and Sisters We Grow, a two-part exhibition organized with Alternative Space Loop. Um, Christine Blanco is an Oakland-based artist and was born and raised in the Bay Area. She creates work that is inspired by the local environment as well as her grandmother's home in the Philippines. Her work in Sewing Worlds pictured here. Uh, it draws on her grandmother's home while also posing a question for a local audience. Embedded Bricks is inspired by the brick ground laid around her grandmother's home to stabilize the building from the flood-soaked land. The work in the exhibition includes bricks made from the clay and dirt Blanco sourced from her own backyard. Over the course of the summer and 2022, Blanco held gatherings where she invited members of her community to inscribe the unfired bricks with their intentions. Participants were encouraged to contemplate their connections to ritual protection and care. In the gallery, Blanco set a box with note cards with the question above reading, what do you want protected? Christine Blanco's installation prompts audiences to think critically about protection and what we care about. What are the beings and places we want to survive? Binta Eofimi's primary medium is the cities of Oakland and San Francisco. Their expansive practice is centered around the movement, making, manufacturing, and authorship of public and private space. They are particularly interested in the activation of vacant sites in San Francisco and Oakland as spaces for reclamation and possibility. One of Aofimi's long-term projects that's pictured here is The Commons. Located in a long vacant storefront in downtown Oakland, 
AOFEMI worked with architects and community members to renovate the space to become an activation site for Black and Indigenous residents of Oakland. Commons, which officially opened its doors for use in 2021, has hosted dance performances, craft fairs, readings, and other gatherings. AOFEMI's intention is for Black and Indigenous res residents of Oakland and the larger Bay Area to take space for themselves. Partly as a response to the dwindling Black population in the Bay Area, AOFEMI's activations and vacant sites seek to give space for Black and Indigenous joy and creativity. AOFEMI's installation in Sewing Worlds, entitled Notes for Black Power Garden, invokes the garden as a space for contemplation, radical rest, and the imagining of an oasis in everyday life, a utopian gesture that evokes Black and Indigenous presence, poetics, and economy. Notes for Black Power Garden is an invitation for viewers to imagine an expansive vision for what gardens can do, what they can hold, and how they can heal. Aofimi incorporates herbs and local plants to conjure a space for healing and relaxation. The installation also points to physical location of Black Power Garden in the artist's neighborhood, a reimagining of a vacant lot and a site of potential. In addition to the many artists who incorporate care and community in their individual practices, I also want to touch on two artist-run projects that place a great a lot of emphasis on community and how to show up for them. Uh, this is an image of a community event at real time and space. 그래서 실시간 공간 리얼 타임 앤 스페이스에서 이제 이벤트를 가졌던 공 사진입니다. So, real time and space is located in Oakland's Chinatown and is a building with 15 work only artist studios. It was founded in 2011 by artists Emma Spurtis and Mark Taylor. Real Time and Space, or RTS, offers affordable studios as well as a residency program, artist talk series, and performances. Founders Spurtis and Taylor understood that crucial to artists being able to live here is the availability of studio space. After securing the lease of the 5,500 square foot former print shop, they set about creating small and large studio spaces, plus a common area and a wood shop for artists of many different disciplines to rent. Recognizing the need for a closed community of artists, as well as bringing in new voices, the residency program was founded with the intention of hosting local and national and international artists with space and a stipend. I was the recipient of a residency in 2012 and co-established a library for the studio space. The experience was formative and led to many long-lasting friendships and collaborations to many of the artists who have had studios there. And this is a, an image of a performance at Land and Sea in Oakland. Mm -hmm. 이것은 육지와 바다라는 공간에서 이제 퍼포먼스를 했던 장면입니다. Land and Sea also operates out of Oakland and is a small press and venue. Run by artists Maria Otero and Chris Duncan, Land and Sea was founded in 2009 as a way to, uh, uh, to publish small editions of books and records by artists from the Bay Area and beyond. The project evolved to include performances and exhibitions, first at different locations across the Bay Area, and then starting in 2014 in a storefront studio in Oakland. The storefront, which also functions as Duncan's artist studio, hosts sound and art events and performances and other happenings that combine visual, sonic, performance, and literary arts, as well as pop-ups for other small publishers and cultural facilitators. In an interview with SF MoMA's Open Space publication, Duncan said, over the years, we have been we have seen so-called economic development lead to the disappearance of many places where people can perform, experiment, or exhibit in Oakland, especially following the ghost ship fire. This is just a little background on ghost ghost ship. Uh, ghost ship was a converted warehouse in the Fruitvale district in Oakland. It was one of many warehouse collectives in Oakland where artists lived and worked and carved out a space for themselves. In 2016, a fire occurred and destroyed the warehouse and killed 36 people. 
in the wake of the fire, the city of Oakland began to crack down on these converted warehouses, some of them illegally converted, making it even more difficult for artists to find live work spaces. The effects of this are still felt in many communities in Oakland. Duncan and Otero are longtime residents of Oakland and recognize the role the arts play in gentrification. In the same interview on Open Space, our relationship to gentrification feels complicated. Some will see an art space as the first wave of gentrification. They're not wrong. The change we have seen to the neighborhood Golden Gate that land and sea borders is real and was set in motion long before we moved in. We tread lightly, treat everyone who walks through our doors with respect and keep a low profile. Otero and Duncan approach the physical space with a lot of care for the arts community, but also for the neighborhood as well. I'm going to end with a few closing thoughts. Uh, in 2013, I attended a conference in Vancouver organized by Philip Magazine titled Institutions by Artists, which featured speakers from all over the world who ran art spaces. Uh, one of the biggest takeaways from the conference, besides meeting many ambitious, brave, funny, and stubborn people who had persisted despite any number of obstacles, was hearing people talk through how they arrived at their solutions. It wasn't the ideas and the solutions themselves that were the most valuable, though I took plenty of notes about those and have on more than one occasion used what I have learned. It was a sense that what problems, whether social or financial or cultural, are when viewed from a creative perspective are the seeds of innovation. The speakers shared a way of looking at the world as full of potential to unlock. And that potential seemed most potent when attacked not by a single individual, an artist or curator striking out alone to make something happen, but by a makeshift community with a shared set of principles and ambitious vision. It is easy, too easy really, to list the problems in our scene and then to see that list as an imped impediment to doing anything cool or substantial but with stubborn persistence that pushes onward with an honest knowledge of what this place is about, both good and bad, even the most inhospitable city can be seen as not simply deserving of good cultural productions. But despite it all, good culture, art, and music, and efforts to push for social justice, justice both large and small, are always there fighting with plenty of room for more. Thank you. Uh, 저도 많은 생각을 하게 되면서 저희 그 서울의 경우하고도 비교를 하면서 좀 들어보는 시간이었던 것 같습니다. Yeah, I've been um, listening to it. It really made me contemplate, and then uh, really uh, made us made me to like, think about what it is like in Seoul here and now. 